If Europe is to ever recover from its financial crisis and economic downturn, people are going to have to have confidence in its banking system. Europe has just completed an evaluation of that system. This is Steve Wiseman at the Peterson Institute for International Economics with Morris Goldstein to tell us about that evaluation, in effect, to evaluate the evaluation. First, Morris, thanks for being here and tell us what the evaluation consisted of. Well, thank you, uh, Steve. What the evaluation consists of is an exercise on 123 European banks where you try to determine whether these banks will have adequate bank capital in an environment that's very adverse and stressful. So you, you do these scenarios of uh, adverse events and you try and see whether banks uh, have enough capital to remain uh, solvent. So that's why they call them stress tests. So they have to be stressful, what, that's right. What was the uh, result? Did, uh, how many banks, at least according to the evaluation, passed the stress test? Uh, well, most of the banks uh, uh, passed. The report actually has four main uh, findings. Uh, they are the capital shortfall for the 123 banks together is about 25 billion euros. Second, only 24 EU banks fail the test. That is, they're undercapitalized, even less once you take account of the capital that they raised at the beginning of the year, 14. Uh, third, the undercapitalized banks are all in Greece, Cyprus, and Italy. And finally, the largest banks in France and Germany have ample capital. So uh, this was taken as pretty good news by in a lot of media accounts. Uh, was it really? Uh, well, I don't believe it for a minute. In other words, I find the results not, I repeat, not credible. And uh, there's a, quite a few reasons for that. Okay, let's go over them one by one. First, well, the main defect, and the one I'm going to spend the most attention on, is that the test does not include a so-called leverage ratio. Uh, I read the entire 51-page report, and the term leverage ratio is nowhere to be seen. Well, before we proceed, what does the term mean? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to explain. There are two kinds of bank capital ratios. The first kind we call risk-based capital ratios. And what they do is you take the each kind of bank asset and you weight it. You give it a weight between 100 and sometimes more, between 0 and 100 percent, sometimes can be even more than 100 percent. So, for example, if your bank makes a, a car loan, that could have a risk weight of 100 percent. If it makes a home mortgage, that might only have a risk weight at 25 percent. And you take all these different kind of loans and you weight them up and you get a final figure called risk weighted assets. And that's what you put in the denominator of the capital ratio. So that's one kind of capital ratio. The second kind is called the leverage ratio, which I was just uh, mentioning. The difference there is in the denominator, you don't use any weights. You put all the bank's assets and you don't weight them at all. So that's the difference. Uh, and you may say, well, why should I care about this thing? It's very arcane. What, what? Well, it turns out to matter a lot. Because in the last decade, there's been a lot of research. And what that research shows is that leverage ratios do a good job of distinguishing sick from healthy banks, whereas the risk-based capital ratios do a very bad job. And the ECB in its 2014 test used only the risk-based measures. So consider the following facts when you're trying to evaluate these results. If you look at the 10 largest US banking firms before the 2007 to 2009 crisis, they all reported high risk-weighted capital ratios. All their regulators said they're very well capitalized. In contrast, the leverage ratios were telling you 
that these banks had very thin capital cushions, that they were very fragile. Well, a lot of those banks wound up needing official support. So the leverage ratios were telling you the right thing. The risk-based capital ratios were telling you the wrong thing. Similarly, if you look at median capital levels for the top 20 EU banks, you find that their leverage ratios declined from around 6% in the mid-1990s to just about 3% before the crisis. So again, thin capital cushions. Uh, the risk-based ratios were telling you that they're very well capitalized. Again, the leverage ratios gave you the right indication of fragility. The risk-based ratios gave you the wrong one. If you look at the bank that had the highest risk-based capital ratio in the 2011 test, that was the last test the ECB did before this one. Who was at the top of the list? A bank called Irish Life and Permanent. It had a huge risk-based capital ratio, so it should have been very, very safe. Uh, in 2012, that bank had to go into government restructuring. Mm -hmm. Dexia, the large Franco-Belgian bank, uh, that passed the 2011 test using risk-based ratios, flying colors. A few months after that, Dexia had to be rescued at great taxpayer expense. And there been a, there's been a study, an important study, in 2013 by two European economists. And they found that using leverage ratios in the 2011 stress test would have produced dramatically different results. If you'd used a 3% leverage ratio as the target that banks had to hit in that test, 26 banks would have failed instead of three. And among the failures would have been the largest German and French banks, Deutsche Bank, Commerce Bank, BNP Paribas, Sakgen, a 4.5% leverage ratio would have caught all the EU banks that failed over the next two years. In contrast, a risk-based measure, no matter how high you set it, you wouldn't have identified the banks that subsequently failed. Uh, when sensible leverage ratios are used for the capital hurdle rate in these tests, the aggregate capital shortfall for EU banks winds up in the hundreds of billions of euros, not the 25 billion or the 14 billion that the EU ECB tells you is the total shortfall. The US Federal Reserve runs stress tests that include a leverage ratio. They've done that since 2012. The Bank of England, later this year, is coming out with its own stress tests. They're gonna have a leverage ratio. Canadian banks, use a leverage ratio. According to IMF figures, the large EU banks have lower leverage ratios than large US banks in the same accounting framework. In view of all of the above, I think the press and bank analysts ought to, ought to put three tough questions to ECB President Draghi and to Ms. Nui, who is the manager of the stress test. Question number one. Why didn't you include a leverage ratio in the 2014 stress test? Question two, will you include a leverage ratio in the next EU-wide bank stress test? If not, why not? Third, suppose the ECB had included a leverage ratio in the 2014 test. Suppose we let them pick the capital measure they like the, the best, uh, uh, common equity tier one, and then we said, well, but you, now you have to use total assets in the denominator. Let's put a, a hurdle rate of, say, 5% for the baseline scenario and 4% for the adverse scenario. If you did that, how many banks are going to fail? Will Deutsche Bank pass? Will Commerce Bank pass? Will BNP Paribas pass? Will Sakgen pass? That's the question we need the answer to, and that's why I think these tests are not credible. So let me just ask you to conclude by uh, saying what the market reaction has been uh, from these stress tests. The media reaction has been moderately positive. What about the markets? 
Well, yesterday, bank stocks went down. Uh, so uh, I think that's appropriate. I think the test is disappointing. What we need is truth in advertising, and this really didn't, uh, didn't, uh, didn't meet that. But you also have to recognize this is a pretty uh, arcane uh, issue. You know, I'm talking about these different kind of capital right. ratios, a lot of people. Uh, and they say, well, they did this asset quality review, and it did thousands of people, and it took a long time. But in the end, you really have to ask yourself, are these results credible? And the test they use is not a robust test. And if they'd used the leverage ratio, I think they would have got entirely different results. So. <laughs> well, on that note, thank you very much, Morris.